helps to you seeking to do your will in all things. Help us to bring light to those in darkness. We ask these things to the honor and glory of your name. Amen. The intro hymn number 822, 822.
you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Blessed be his kingdom. Blessed Lord and Father. We have ascended in your name and in Call it purity, Almighty God. to God in the highest. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship with the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtues and godly living. And may come to those ineffable joys. You prepare for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Be be seated for the ministry of the word. reading when the word is taken from Daniel 7 verses 1 to 3 and 15 to 18. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylonian, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he laid in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came out 
out of the sea, different from one another. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possesses the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The word of the Lord. The appointed Psalm, number 149, may be found on page 665 of your Book of Common Prayer. A reading from the Word of God, written in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 to 23. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation and had believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as, as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may perceive what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. The gradual hymn, 539, 539.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. But that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you la laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. If anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the gospel of Christ. I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in the month of November, and here at Christ Church, Parish Church, we will observe the entire month as a stewardship month, stewardship month. And you will be aware of that because going forward, you will hear a particular hymn not only in the first Sunday of the month, second Sunday, third, fourth, or even if we have a fifth Sunday, you will hear the hymn 539, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my life and let it be. Now the fourth verse first states, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I, would I withhold. And usually when we hear or sing that particular verse and we think about stewardship, we basically limit it to money. And money, of course, is an important aspect of stewardship. As stewards, basically we are managers, managers of God's property. So money, even if we claim the money is ours, ultimately belongs to Almighty God. And therefore we will have to give an account how we have managed the Lord's money. So money is an important aspect of stewardship, of stewardship. But there are other areas of God's property. Of course, we talk about time. Time belongs to Almighty God. He is the creator of time. And therefore, the time that we have is a gift from God. And therefore, how we manage our time 
but also we will have to give an account. Added to that, the talents. These are all God-given talents. What we can do, or even to provide for ourselves, to do things which can help others. These are our talents. They're our talents, but they belong to Almighty God, and therefore how we've abused our talents. Now for the last couple of months, nearly a year, we've emphasized another aspect, which is God-given, in terms of the spiritual gifts. And the spiritual gifts to help to build up the body of Christ. Sometimes it includes our natural talents, but sometimes it is something that is there to assist the church in its ministry and mission. And therefore, for this particular year, the Stewardship Month, we're going to talk about the church and how we can be good stewards of the church in terms of our faith. And this year, we're going to limit it, not just to faith in general, or the church in general, but the Anglican faith. And therefore, the theme for this year of Stewardship Month is stewards of our Anglican faith. Stewards of our Anglican faith. We have a goodly heritage. Stewards of our Anglican faith. Now, being an Anglican, and I, I'm an Anglican, most of you, of course, I think all of us are here, we are Anglicans, we have to be aware of what's been going on and people's assessments and views of what it means to be the Anglican Church. We are, of course, in the month of November, and the month of November, and at the end of this month, we will celebrate, in fact, leading up the entire month, the whole question of nationhood, um, Republican status, etc. And therefore, of course, we will note on our flag, there is a broken trident. And the broken trident, of course, is to symbolize our break from the colonial past. And therefore, it causes us, those who are part of the Anglican faith, sometimes, especially when people comment of the church and its colonial past, being part of the colonial era. And therefore, should we not break, not only with the colonial past, but all those things associated with colonialism, and therefore, should we break from the church? And some persons, therefore, have had some very serious things to say, about our history, very serious things to say about the Anglican Church. So how can we be stewards of our faith, of our Anglican faith? It seems as though the persons are not seeing us in a good light. But I believe that we need to understand about the faith in terms of Jesus Christ. Jesus is able to take what is negative and to transform into the good. Jesus is able to take even evil and sin and transform into justice and in hope. And so we can see that many of us, in terms of our ancestors, may have been, of course, on the wrong side of the colonial past. But God has made a way working in and through his church to give hope, to give justice. And not just the church, but in many other institutions. The part of a colonial past but now, in these new days, if we chart a way forward. So I don't think we need to run away or to feel embarrassed or to feel less than. Because therefore, what is the alternative? Because sometimes persons will say, well, okay, I will break from that particular church. I will break from the Anglican church because of the past. So you break from that church and you want to go and start up a new, fresh, pure church. Good luck with that. Because when you get that new, fresh, pure church, what happens? After a while, that takes on its own baggage. You know what happens? You leave that church, and you join another church. That gets its own baggage. Then you take that church, then you leave another church, and it goes on and on and on, and that's what happens. But the Anglican church, in terms of its gift, of course, of course, of challenges, it's this gift that it is very broad. history, that everybody is going to see things the same way. But God is a broad and loving God, and therefore he embraces. Sometimes people like to exclude, but not God. God seeks to include, include. And because of that, 
because of that, we need to know that the Anglican Church at its best, at its best, includes persons who have different points of view. There's some people who go to the Anglican Church, and members of the Anglican Church, they love incense, especially the servers. They love incense, and they're Anglican. And there's some people who are Anglicans who can't stand incense. In fact, the fans start to go out, or sometimes they leave. Some people who like candles, some people like the smells and the bells. And there are some people who like the tambourines and that kind of expression. But they're all Anglicans. You'll go to some Anglican churches in England, people sometimes even wear robes. As I said, some people, you'll go to church, you wonder, is this the Eastern Orthodox Church? But they are included. They're part of the Anglican church. And I believe it is a real gift, a gift. But this gift also can be somewhat challenging. Because you can have something that is so broad that it can no longer be defined. Defined as a church or even defined as Christian. Because, of course, there are certain things which allow us to define who we are and what we're about and what we should be doing. So you can have be broad, we can't be still so broad that there's no definition. And that's why, as this part of this reflection for going forward, some Anglican bishops gather together, as they do at Lambeth, when they gather every 10 years to reflect upon the church. And back in 1888, they gathered and they said, what defines us? What are the essentials of who we are? As they looked back and they were going forward. And they said, after a while, there are four things that we cannot do without. If we, if, we, if we get rid of those things, we're no longer Anglican to a certain extent, we would suggest we may not even be Christian. And these four things are going to be laid out for this particular month. But before I answer or explain to you what those are, I'm going to give you another issue. Now we know of a particular game that also came from England, from the past, all right? And it's called cricket, right? It's cricket. Now, of course, cricket started in England, went to different parts of the world, of course, and now we're playing it not only in terms of cricket, but of course we have a particular tournament. We're not part of it, but that's another story. But the question I want to ask, what is essential to cricket? What do we need? What must be in place for us to say that we're involved in cricket and not playing some other game? Now, some person may say, well, you know, when you have crickets, you know, it's nice to have pads. It's nice to have a score there to take the score. It's nice to have a scoreboard. It's nice to have an umpire, all those type of things. That's fine. That's really wonderful. We have the fullness of what it means to be cricket. But we would know that, of course, you could play beach cricket. You could play cricket. Sometimes you don't have the stumps. But the point is, therefore, what is essential? to be in cricket. And therefore, I would suggest that what's essential is that you must have a bat and you must have a ball. If you don't have a bat and a ball, well, you could call it cricket, but it's not cricket. And the bishops had that same kind of thinking, I'm not using cricket, about the Christian faith. What is essential? And they said, well, we know, as I said before, is it essential to have incense? No, it's not essential to have incense. We can have a church without incense. We can even have a church, sometimes we don't have a building. Sometimes the building is in disrepair. I remember when I served in another place, we were doing some repairs that we had to meet in the school. We were still the church. We were still the anchor church. So therefore, what was essential? And the bishops came with four things. First of all, they said, the Bible. We can't be the church without the Bible. The second thing they said, we can't be the church because in the Bible, Jesus says certain things that we must do. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he said, go into all the world, baptize. And therefore they said, baptism and Eucharist are essential for us to be Christian, for to be Anglicans. The third thing, the creeds. The creeds of the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. And finally, bishops. I will explain that going along because I'm going to have a series. But today I want us to talk about the Bible. Why the Bible 
is essential to who we are as Christians. If, for example, we decided as a synod, and we make all kinds of decisions in synod, which is the kind of the parliament of the church, and we say, well, from next week, we're not going to read from the Bible, we're going to read from the Quran, we would no longer be Anglicans. We would no longer be Christians. Because, of course, you have to have the Bible. But you have to have the Bible for the particular point of the Bible, because, of course, there are many persons who claim the Bible. And, of course, sometimes that can create some real, real challenges. So I believe a, a real gift of our church is how we approach the Bible. Because, as I said, if you read the Bible, all kinds of people can take the Bible and quote the Bible. As the saying goes, even the devil can quote scripture. So we have to have an approach to the Bible. And the approach to the Bible is one whereby we are being systematic. You see, the devil can be, can be all over the place, picking and choosing. But even sometimes when we are earnest in our approach of trying to really get into the word of God, the Bible, to, you know, understand the path forward, we can find ourselves in difficulties. It reminds me of the story of the particular man who he was having a challenge and he said, well, I need to hear from God. And I need to hear from God and I need to hear from God in terms of the Bible. So he said to the, the, the Lord, Lord, I'm going to open the Bible wherever my finger finds in terms of the verse and chapter, it will know and I will know that you're guiding me in this particular way. So he opened the Bible and said, Lord, show me. And he opened, and he opened the Bible and it came across Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. And it says, Judas departed and went and hanged himself. So he said, well, God can't be telling me to go and hang myself. Let me try again. So he said, Lord, guide me about what I should do with my way forward. And he opened the Bible and he put his finger right down. He came across Luke chapter 10, verse 37. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You can get yourselves in real trouble in that kind of approach to the scriptures. And that's why a real gift of the church is how we approach scriptures. We approach scripture, and not just us, but of course the Anglican church, in terms of reading it systematically. Okay? Every time that we gather here as Christians, as Anglican Christians, we read not just one portion of scripture. We have the Old Testament, we have the Psalm, we have the Epistle, and we have the Gospel. And we read it systematically so we can get the context, okay? Not bobbing the wind. I don't get up in the morning and say, well, what am I preach on? Well, sometimes that can happen. But I know, based upon the readings for that particular day, we have a lectionary. And we also have lectures. Persons who have been encouraged to see their spiritual gift, their talent maybe, to bring the word of God, not just for themselves, but for us as we gather in church to hear what God is saying, not just to me, not just to you, but God is saying to everyone. And God is saying to us, and therefore we're going to here at this church take a very serious step in trying to help us to be stewards of our faith and having a real appreciation of what the word of God means. And therefore we're going to have a lectures seminar. It's going to be at the end of this month. And persons who basically believe that they've been called to that ministry, not that they'll be taught how to read, you know, that happens when you're at school, but to know that there are certain ways, of course, that you may bring the word. How do you prepare yourself for the word? So that when you finish the word and you've prepared yourself in the proper way, it's not a question of sometimes, you know, in this way we say, the word of the Lord and what do we respond? The lecture says, this is the word of the Lord, how do we respond? Thanks be to God. Now sometimes you can hear, there's another way a person says, here ends the reading, and the person says, thanks be to God. Because the person didn't seem to be prepared in reading that particular word. They just got up and read it. But hopefully in that lecture's um, seminar, which is coming up, 
that you, if you believe you're called to that, that it's your gift to bring the word in a systematic way for God's people, I encourage you to do that. But also, it must be said, for us to say thanks be to God, thanks be to God, we have to prepare ourselves also. In the lectionary, it's not only in the back of the Book of Common Prayer, although we've changed that, much to my annoyance, but that's another story. But we sent out the readings, for therefore that when you get here, it's not the first time, hopefully, that you have read Daniel or the readings for the Sunday, that you have yourself, as the, the, um, the college says, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. So when I'm preaching or when we hear the word, that God is speaking to us. God is speaking to us. Again, based upon the importance of the word, because the word and, of course, what it says is very, very important. And it's important from the point of view that, yes, many things are said in the scriptures. Sometimes it can be confusing. But it all points to the way, again, how we read the Bible in the Anglican Church. Have you noticed that, yes, we read the first lesson, we remain seated. That the psalm, sometimes we sit, sometimes we stand. For the epistle, we remain seated. All right? But you notice that when it comes to the gospel, what happens? We all stand. And we stand because of that reading, we're hearing from Christ himself. All right? And all the readings, therefore, and all the word points to the word of God. And in John chapter 1, it says... And the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has ever known the Father except the one who is from the bosom's heart. Verse 18, he has made him known. We now know God based upon Jesus Christ. And therefore, the words of the Bible points to the word of God in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. Now because, of course, Jesus Christ, the word became flesh, there's another challenge about the Bible. And it's sometimes related to how the word become, became flesh. When Jesus was a human being, he revealed the glory of God, as John 1, 18 says, he has made him known because he was able to now teach us through the parables, things that are recorded in the New Testament, the gospel, about the ways, the values, and the priorities of God. Very, very important. That's why we need to read the Bible. Read what Jesus is saying to us. All right? Read what Jesus is saying to us. But it also must be stated, because Jesus walked around as an ordinary human being, sometimes people will see Jesus but not fully appreciate that it is God in the flesh. They just dismiss him. We know him. He's Mary's son. You know. He's, we know his brothers and sisters. He's from Nazareth. Can anything good have come out of Nazareth? Right? You can be dismissive. And therefore, we have to be bearing in mind that how we approach the scriptures can sometimes be in that kind of vein. That is, the scriptures reveal the glory of God, but sometimes they can conceal because sometimes people just see it as another book. And with any other book, sometimes they think they can explain things away. They can look for the loophole. They can bend it to what and how they believe it should be. And that is a very unfortunate. Allow the scriptures, allow the word to really, really inform the way forward in terms of our relationship with Christ. And to do that, we have to take time at home and in church to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. There's another aspect that I hope that we would understand in terms of the value of the scriptures is the opportunities are presented to us to have Bible study. The opportunity for us to bring our Bibles to church. I am always concerned that persons will say in one hand or one vein, yes, we like to hear the Bible. But when there's opportunities sometimes, be it for Bible study or even during Lent, you don't see persons. Why is that? Why is that? I don't know. But if we do that, we're just dismissing the Bible basically we can get back to that when they get back to it. 
And that, hopefully, is unfortunate. And it's unfortunate because if we don't allow the Bible and the Word of God to inform us, then what happens is we start to, I believe, accept, we allow ourselves to be led down the wrong path because we're no longer biblically literate. Another gift of our church, yet again, our church, we have some challenges of our past. But one of the gifts of our church is we were involved in education. We were involved in education. And the major part of our education course was not only to help persons in terms of the three R's, but also for biblical literature, literacy. And many, therefore, the older generation, they know the word. They're able to quote the word. They're able to apply the word, I mean, especially when they're going through challenging times. But this is changing. This is changing. And it's changing from the point of view, of course, that persons now in the church schools, not all. Don't place a high priority on that aspect. And maybe we may be going into a particular place of overseas. I have a friend who was raised in Anglican and they now live in the United States. And over there, they're called Episcopalians. And she was there with a group in a baby shower. And they were talking, and some of these persons were going to church. Not all. Some of the persons were going to church. Not all. And they were discussing baby names for this particular child. They knew there was going to be a girl. And they were talking about all these different names. And one person, I don't think she went to church, but she said, what about the name Jezebel? That sounds like a nice name. Now, of course, we know, hopefully we know, the background of that particular name. Now, think about it. Jezebel as a name doesn't sound bad. It has a nice ring to it. You know, it sounds good, right? It sounds good, right? But the point is, unless you have the context and the understanding, of course, these things start to slip in, right? and to guide us away. So we need, therefore, especially for us as Anglicans, to understand who we are and whose we are. And therefore, what are the essentials of the essentials? We're going to look at three others going forward. But today, I want us to give thanks to Almighty God for the Bible, for the Holy Scriptures. And therefore, when we say in our worship, Sunday by Sunday, hopefully, when we gather for Bible study, and the person in the lecture says, the word of the Lord, this is the word of the Lord, we will respond with, Amen. Now stand up from our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, greater of heaven, of all that is seen or unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ.
that's needed in prayer. Love it, Lord, help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your word. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry of lectures. Thank you, Lord, as we gather as your church with the saints to come together to understand your word, to understand the history, the context, and to wrestle, to know, Lord, your word is a light to our feet and a light to our paths and a strength to our lives. Pray, Lord, for your blessings as we deal with mourning of loss. And understand, Lord, in your same word that death is not the end. Your son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. And the nothing, it says in your word, shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. Pray therefore, Lord, as we proclaim the gospel of Christ in the world, which, of course, many competing visions, will you commit to who we are and whose we are. Lord, in your mercy, not only as Anglicans, but as Christians in general, Lord, in your mercy, let's continue our prayers now with a form of intercession, form F. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Lord, in your love, bless and inspire all members of the clergy, especially Howard, our Archbishop, Michael, our Bishop, and Mark, our priest, that their lives may be examples of their teaching, that they may rightly faithfully administer you. Guide and protect all heads of state and all who bear rule, especially those in this land. Sandra, our president, Mia, our prime minister, all members of parliament, and all persons serving in government. Direct those who administer justice and strengthen those who guard and protect the land. Reveal the common good to those in positions of public trust and to decision makers in industry and commerce. Enlighten with your spirit all places of education and learning. Comfort and help all persons who are in any trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those who have requested the prayers of the church. Remember our brothers and sisters, especially our departed relatives, and all others who have died in your faith and fear. Grant them peace and eternal life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the witness of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, for the holy patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have been good examples in their several generations. And finally, let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Accept our prayers and intercessions, Father, Father, according to your wisdom, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. The Acts of Penitence on page 123. Now, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a moment of silence to reflect upon our lives.
and let us therefore confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon them your sins, confirm and strengthen all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please stand. We are the body of Christ, by the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and have all been made to drink of the one spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. warm welcome to all of you worshiping with us this morning both in church and virtually and we pray that almighty God would open your hearts as we listen to his word that we can go out and share with others now if there are any visitors worshiping with us this morning I would like you to stand please any visitors first time no visitors with us. Then let's go on to the highlights of our lives. Any birthday celebrations to share today? Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot to sing the welcome song for you, even though there are no visitors. Let's sing the welcome song. yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Great. Now 
now there were no birthday celebrations. Are there? No. Let's go on to anniversary of baptism. Anniversary of confirmation. Any, yes, we have one person on the floor, confirmation. May God continue to keep you steadfast in his stuff. Let's give a round of applause. What about wedding anniversaries? Anyone celebrating wedding anniversary? We go to the information technology section and listen to the remainder of the notices. And now to this week's birthdays. Today, Sunday, the 6th of November, is the birthday of Erla Best and Uriel Calendar. Tomorrow, Monday, the 7th of November, we celebrate with Adele Harewood, Graham Howell, and Bernice Mullen. On November the 8th, Beverly Blackman and Harold Clark celebrate their birthday. On November 10th, we celebrate with Denise Drayton. On the 11th of November, Merlene Brewster celebrates her birthday. And on November 12th, we celebrate with Myrtle Brown and Sheila Husband. Happy birthday to you all. We share with you in these celebrations. And we thank God for the opportunity he has given us to witness for him through these events in our lives. May God continually bless and strengthen you. Please remember in your prayers all who have died and those who mourn, especially members of our parish family. We remember Sister Arimintha Williams, late of Sayers Court, Christchurch. Her funeral service will take place on Tuesday, November 8th, at 2.30 p.m. Please note the time. Give to the departed eternal rest and let light perpetual shine upon them. We offer our love and support to all who are bereaved. Flowers are given to the glory of God in memory of the late Doreen Evelyn on the anniversary of her birthday, November 11th by her daughters Patricia Prescott and Myrna Evelyn. We thank them for their generosity. Christchurch Cares, Sunday School Healthy Snap Pack. We would like to thank Joan Warner, who provided the Sunday School Snap Pack for the month of September. The Snap Pack for the month of October was sponsored by Rodney and Audrey Trotman. We thank them for their generous donation. Sincere thanks to everyone for your continued support. Here's what's happening this week at CCPC. Today is All Saints Sunday, and our services this morning started at 7 a.m. with Holy Eucharist with hymns, at 9.30 a.m., a solemn Eucharist, and this evening at 5 p.m., we will be having Disciple Life Process. On Tuesday, November 8th, at 6.30 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Parochial Church Council. Members of the Finance Committee and the Buildings and Grounds Committee are also asked to attend this meeting. On Wednesday, November 9th, at 10 a.m., Holy Eucharist with Prayers of Intention. And on Thursday, November 10th, we continue our adult study of the Bible via Zoom at 6 p.m. On Saturday, November 12th, the Mother's Union will meet at 4 p.m. Next Sunday, November 13th, is the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, proper 28th. 
on the second Sunday of Stewardship Month with the theme, Stewards of Our Anglican Faith, We Have a Goodly Heritage. Next Sunday is also Remembrance Sunday. And at 7 a.m., the first service will be Instructed Holy Eucharist with Hymns and at 9.30 a.m., Instructed Choral Eucharist. And at 5 p.m., Disciple Life Process continues. Christ Church Parish Church presents T. Ah, more. A Love of Country Tea Party on Saturday, the 19th of November, 2022, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the Ivan Harewood Center. Come and enjoy a variety of teas, natural juices, and other treats. The ticket price is $35, and tickets are available after the Sunday and Wednesday morning services, or you may purchase them during the church office opening hours, that is, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 12 noon to 2 p.m. Don't miss it. T. Ah. More. Please save the date. Sunday, December the 4th, 2022, at 6 p.m., the Christ Church Parish Church Choir presents Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord, our Advent Recital. Remember, save the day and listen out for more details. Check out our website, www.christchurchpc.com. And also our e-bulletin, Christ Church Connect. Offer to God.
offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and make good thy vows unto the Most High. They offer to read him 837, 837. The presentation of the offering. Father, we offer you these gifts which you have given us. This bread, this
hymn number 837, 837. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father Almighty, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, O Lord, for in the saints you have given us an example of God living, that rejoice in their fellowship, may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and we then receive the crown of glory. Therefore we praise you, join our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Eucharistic Prayer B, found on page 135. Holy and gracious Father, all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you. To your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom you sent to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile to you, the God and Father of all. We therefore bring you these gifts, we ask to make them holy by the power of your Spirit. They may become the body and blood of us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered himself in obedience to your will, the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he gave them thanks, he gave to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Father, calling to mind the death of your Son endured for our salvation, his glorious resurrection and ascension, his continued intercession for us in heaven and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you with thanksgiving this holy and life-giving sacrifice. Look with favor on your church's offering and grant that we eat and drink these holy gifts. May we be filled with your Holy Spirit and become one body in Christ and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. May he make us a perpetual offering to you and neighbors communion with Blessed Mary and the whole company of heaven to share the inheritance of your saints. With him and in him and through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father Almighty, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven in songs of everlasting praise. As our Savior has taught us, so we pray.
We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God.
him for the administration of Holy Communion. 397. 397. Three hundred and ninety three, three nine three.
hymn communion prayer, page 140, 147. Almighty Father, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body. God give you grace to follow his saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Peace.
Sessional Hymn 819819.